All right, if you've got your Bibles, take them to turn to 2 Kings chapter number 6. 2 Kings chapter number 6. I hope you're excited about preaching conference. It's good to see a number of our guests here. It wasn't that long ago, it was me coming, and i tell you what, it is, I know uh, from being out there and coming back, it's always refreshing, always exciting. Had a great start to the week last night. Pastor Clark's message, I don't really know what he preached. Um, I, 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 I kind of do, but you got me distracted because he started talking about Southern cooking. And he started getting me hungry. I started thinking about what it was like as I've been in exile up here in the north. And, uh, you know, I'm like the one fellow who said, we didn't know about cholesterol down south, but if we had, we would have fried it. And uh, that's, that's kind of, that's good cooking right there. And uh, Anyway, he got me distracted, but, uh, but no, I did hear the rest of the message, a couple points, and uh, no, I'm just kidding, but it was good. As it got me thinking, you know, you're always hearing redneck jokes, and so I went looking for some yuppie jokes. I thought, you know, we'll turn it around, and we'll, we'll make fun of them, but you know what I found? There were none. You know why? Because they're not funny, you know, that's just the way it is. Rednecks, they're colorful characters, Southerners, we, you know, but Northerners are just too stiff. So anyway, that's just kind of the way it was. And, uh, oh, settle down. I'm just you're getting offended already. Man, this is chapel. Don't be like the, anyway. All right, 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. I got to get moving here. So I got plenty of time. I got an hour of message and a half hour to preach. So, which is usually the way it is. But anyway, 2 Kings chapter 6. Let's look at verse number 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. The king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore, sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, all for one preacher. I, I love that. I, I don't know about you. There's just certain parts of the Bible I really love. Here's one preacher. And I, all right, get the whole army together and go get that preacher. He's dangerous. And they came by night. He's really dangerous. He's going to get away. He's going to fight him. And compass the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host can pass the city both with horses and chariots. And his servants said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. We're going to skip down, look in verse, I just want to read a couple more verses that kind of go with a, a slightly different story, but yet uh, we're still uh, dealing a, a little bit with the topic here. In verse 24, uh, what happens in verses 18 to 23 is Elisha smites him with blindness, says, hey, fellas, you're in the wrong place. Let me take you to the right place. He takes him over to Samaria and puts him in the hands of the king of Israel and says, okay, guys, you can see now. And they look around and they go, uh, <laughs> you tricked us and we're caught. And uh, the king says, hey, can I kill him? And he says, no, don't kill him. They're your prisoners. Uh, let them go after you feed them. Okay, so we come down to verse 24. And it came to pass after this, after what I just said happened, that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a 
cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. I will get back to that in a little bit. But the heart of the message and the title of the message comes from verse number 17, when it says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. The title of the message this morning is this, Lord, open our eyes. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll look at this this morning. Our God, we are grateful, Lord, for this week where we can be spiritually refreshed and we don't come into it lightly, God. We know that we need you. And we know that we need your power to come upon us. And God, I pray for a reviving in my heart and in the hearts of each one of us as we come and hear the preaching. We pray for your power upon each speaker and pray that you would work in their hearts. Now, God, this morning, I know that I'm nothing, Lord. I know that I just have a message from you and I just need to be your vessel. So I pray that, God, that's all I would be. I pray that, God, you would work through me, give me the right words. And, Lord, most importantly, that your spirit then would go through and work in the hearts of each one of us as we look at your word, as we hear what you have to say. And God, then I pray that lives will be changed as a result. Hearts will be convicted, perhaps some encouraged, perhaps some challenged. Whatever the need is of each individual, I pray you'd meet it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. King of Syria is determined to destroy Israel. And he, he comes and he sets it up and he's ready to attack and he wants to defeat them. And as he's lining it up and as he's setting it up to, to beat them, the preacher comes and says, hey, by the way, the enemy's over there. You don't need to go over there. The king of Israel, being the trusting sort that he is, sends somebody to make sure that's really true. But he sends him over there and he goes, wow, he's right. And we get the idea this didn't happen just once. It happened several times, not once, nor twice. It happened several times. And finally, the king of Syria goes, I've got a spy. Surely there is somebody that's given away my playbook. And he starts talking to his men, and he says, hey, who is on the side of the king of Israel? Because we keep losing to him. Who's doing it? And they said, sir, it's not us. You see, they got a preacher over there. And that preacher keeps telling them where the enemy's going to be. The king of Syria thinks about that for a second, says, well, that's clear enough for me. Let's go silence the preacher. Get the army together. I want to know where he is. And let's get him. And they come and surround him, and there's a servant here. And he is with Elisha, and he comes out, and he sees the host surrounding them. They're everywhere. A huge host, and he goes, Master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? And Elisha, as calm as can be, he says, hey, it's okay. <laughs> I see him. Isn't it great? What? Yeah, look around. We got way more on our side than they got on their side. And I can just see the servant perplexed going, all right, not only are we surrounded by the enemy, but my master has just gone nuts here. This is not good. All right, he's gone crazy. <laughs> There's one, two. One, two. Two, one. There's still two of us. And there's all of them. What in the world are we going to do? Elisha, calm as can be. He said, Lord, open his eyes. The Bible says he looked around and suddenly he stopped seeing through earthly eyes. And he started looking at things the way that God looks at things. And he said, whew, he's not kidding. And notice the Bible says, and I'll get to it in a second, hopefully they're all surrounding Elisha. You see, I believe one of the biggest troubles that we have as young people, college students, adults, and even as preachers sometimes, one of the biggest problems we have is that we get tunnel vision. And we start looking at things 
with earthly eyes and we start interpreting everything on the basis of what we can see and we forget that the Christian life has never been about the flesh. And the Christian life has never been about temporal and earthly things. No, the Christian life has always been about faith. And seeing things the way that God sees them and not on the, the natural plane, but on the supernatural plane. And everything that's going on in this world is not just the way we see it. We look at things, use politics as an example, because I usually do, but we look at things on the political spectrum, and we say, oh, it's the liberals, oh, it's the liberal media, oh, it's Barack Obama, and they are very, very, very good tools of the devil. But it's the devil. It's the devil. In one way, it's the devil. In another way, I think it's God. I don't like it as an American, but as a Christian, I recognize the fact our nation is becoming more wicked every day. And our, uh, our, our, our flaunting our sin in the face of God, he's giving us what we deserve. And the, the answer is not, uh, you look at these contenders, I, although I admit, I, I would just love one presidential candidate to just, ant I mean, every time the media speaks, just smack him in the face verbally with Scripture. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. What do you think about this? Well, I think the Bible says you're wicked. <laughs> I, I, to me, that would be great. I love it. And I'll tell you something. I think somebody, personally, I think somebody like that would get elected. I think Americans are looking for somebody that actually has some guts. Not certain governors down in Indianapolis. But anyway, we, we have lost sight. We're looking at everything on a physical level, and we look at all of these things, and we forget. No, there's things on a supernatural level going on. And some of us, it, we go beyond that. But listen, you, you misunderstand. You have an enemy. And we seem so surprised when the enemy attacks. But the enemy's out to get you. And he always has been. And he's always ready to destroy you. And we need to learn to look, learn to open our eyes and see beyond the way things are on a natural level, level and see what's really going on. Take the matter of temptation. You take a look over there and you see this. A young person, the devil throws that temptation. He knows your weakness. It might be music. It might be entertainment, it might be a friend, it might be a boy, it might be a girl, and he takes that and he throws it in front of you and you start looking through earthly eyes and all you see is something that looks like it would be fun. That looks like it would attract you, that looks like it would be something that would be enjoyable and you're only looking at it that way. When you start looking at it through the eyes of God, you realize that is dangerous to me. I don't want that. It doesn't matter how flashy it is. It doesn't matter how attractive it is. I understand that's the devil's tool, and I don't want it to destroy me. Lord, open our eyes. Well, we begin to look at this. We see in this story, we begin to see some of the characters. I want you to see the king here, uh, the king of Syria, the enemy, the sinister pursuer, if you will. What do you think his objective is? Well, we come to verse number 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel, took counsel and with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall, my, shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. Uh, we look in verse 24 and 25, we read it a little bit ago, and we see that after all of this happens, he comes and puts a siege around Samaria. Now, this, again, this is all really basic, okay? What do you think the goal of the enemy is. It's simple. Your utter destruction. You say, well, Pastor Parrish, uh, that was kind of, duh. Really? Because some of you all, you, th you think he's just an opponent in a game. Well, he kind of outmaneuvered me this time, but it's okay. It's all in the game. It's kind of fun. He doesn't really want to harm me. He's just kind of trip me up. And, you know, it, it's just kind of a game. Listen, my friend, with the devil, with the world, with the flesh, it is not a game. 
They are out for your utter and complete destruction, and they will not stop until you're destroyed. Some preachers need to get a hold of this. We think we can compromise and, and just let down just a little bit, and we think, well, we're just kind of playing their game a little bit, and we're going to play on their terms, and we can get them to come in. That is so stupid. That is utterly foolish. You say, why? Because we're acting like the enemy's not trying to destroy us. Ah, Pastor Paris, what's the big deal? It's just a little bit of that music. It's not that harmful. I'm just going a little ways with that entertainment. I realize that this friend may not be the best person for me, but you know, I'm going to win them. Oh, yeah. Or maybe you're the guy or girl and you're trying what I call missionary dating. Oh, Pastor Parrish, I, I know he's not saved, but I'm going to win him over by dating him. Yeah, right. He's going to win you over. Oh, Pastor Parrish, it's, it's not that big a deal. You know, we, we, can, we can be friends and I won't be affected. You are a fool. You're trying to play a game when there is an enemy that's trying to utterly and completely destroy you. Notice his attack plan. It's threefold. The first thing he's trying to do is set an ambush. We see that in verses 8, and 10, 8 through 10. We've already read it, but he says, hey, I'm going to put my camp there. And, and, and kind of the, the wording to me is the picture of he's trying to set up an ambush. Hey, you know what? <coughs> Let's set up right here. Man, I am really ringing. Let's set up right here. And when they come by, we're going to get them. And Elisha warns him and says, hey, don't go by there. Why? Because there's an ambush set up. There's an ambush set up. And some of you, the preacher keeps warning you. Don't go by there. Don't go over there. It's dangerous over there. You don't need that. And if you're wise, you'll listen to the warning of the preacher. You see, the enemy has never stopped. We forget. You know, we live on this earth. We might live 80, 90 years. We might live 100. But you realize the devil's been around for several thousand? Oh, Pastor Barris, but he never dealt with me. <laughs> I can outsmart him. Yeah, you're not the first person to think that either. The devil knows you. The devil knows your weakness. And the devil is out to catch you off guard. He said in an ambush, this is why in 1 Peter 5, 8, he said this, be sober, be what? Vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is ready for you. He's got an ambush set up for you. You need to be aware of it. Understand, we see the enemy. He also wanted domination. He found out the preacher was stopping him. You know what he wanted to do? He wanted to eliminate the preacher. It's no wonder that we live in a day and age when they're trying to stop us as Christians. Listen, the homosexuals, really the truth is they don't care about us. By the very nature of their sin, the only thing they really care about is themselves. It's, it's the ultimate form of selfish lust and gratification. It's, it's, it's the worst level of it. They don't care about us, but they don't want to hear from us. That's all they really care about. They want us to be silenced. They want us to be quiet. And the devil's got all kinds of gadgets out there now today. Boy, you don't, you, you got a phone. Now, I mean, you go anywhere. And people have got their phone out all the time. Why? I, I wonder how often now we ever stop and think about what it means to be a Christian. We don't have time. Because the moment we do, we get a text. The moment we do, we get a, most people don't seem to understand, there's an off button on those things. Now, you'll forgive me. I realize you say, well, Pastor Bruce, you are anti-technology. I am not anti-technology. I don't handle it, don't do much with it. And I like my flip phone, and I still don't answer whenever I'm busy. And that may sound rude and ridiculous, but I'm sorry. Sometimes I've got things to do. And when I'm having my devotions, when I'm having prayer, you know, sometimes people, you need to learn to shut things off. 
There's a reason that he said, be still and know that I am God. You see, here's what the devil wants to do. You go, I don't even know why they still got them. A while back, they started putting these TVs. I mean, I want to eat a cheeseburger. I don't want to watch the news. I was sitting at a restaurant the other day, and I, and I look up, and there's this, I don't know what it was. It, it was like, it looked like these people were supposed to have already died, and they were alive. It was really, it was like some kind of zombie thing. I'm sitting there eating, and they're shooting, and there's blood splattering everywhere. I'm going, boy, that barbecue burger really tastes good right now. I, I don't want to see that. Why in the world do I have to have that while I'm eating? And I also don't understand why they do it, because most people aren't looking at that anyway. They got their phone while they're eating across from the other person who has their phone. I've always often wondered if their conversation was they send each other a text, you know? <laughs> I just kind of wonder that. They're sitting there, why? The devil wants to distract you. And he's trying to get you so busy with so many things that you don't hear the preacher, that you don't hear the word of God. He's trying to destroy us because he wants to be the only voice we hear. I got to move. He wants to starve us. In verses, we saw in verse 24 and 25 that he comes down and he lays siege to Samaria. He couldn't get them by silencing the preacher, so he says, I'll go right to the source. I'm going to starve them out. And spiritually, that's what the devil wants you to do. That's why he doesn't want you reading your Bible. That's why he doesn't, he may not mind if you read your Bible as long as you're not paying attention while you're reading it. As long as you're not getting something out of it, I'll have a young person come in, or, or I've had adults come in, and they'll sit in my office, and one of the first questions we start talking about is their devotions. And you're starving. They say, I just can't understand why I'm defeated. Well, I do. All right, who do you think is going to win? You get a boxer up here, and he's been training, and he's been uh, eating all the right things, and he's been working out, and he's ready to go, and you get somebody else who's been on a fast for 30 days. Tell me who's going to win the boxing match. That's kind of a given. We know that. But when you starve yourself spiritually, then you never fill up on the word of God, but you fill up on the junk of this world, and then you wonder why you're defeated by the enemy. That's the reason. He's out to destroy you. The Bible, the, the enemy knows in Romans 6, 16, he said, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are. You belong to whoever you surrender to. And so he's going to starve you so that he can get you. Well, beyond the enemy, we see the preacher. What's his objective? To keep me from having any fun? <laughs> to hold me back? No, no, the preacher, you know, his job is to protect the people. 1 Peter 5, 2, the Bible says that his job is to feed the flock of God taking the oversight thereof. You've got a good preacher. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to feed you with the word of God so that you'll be strong. He watches for your souls. Most people don't like the beginning of Hebrews 13, 17, and they get so upset at the beginning, they miss the next part. Obey them that have the rule over you. I hate that part. You need to read the rest of it. For they watch for your what? Any preacher with assault takes that, res that, that responsibility very seriously. When I was pastoring in Idaho, and, and now even with, with uh, the young people, I've told them, I, I told the folks in Idaho, you know, there's times when I'm up at night, and there's times throughout the day when I spend time thinking about where you are at spiritually. You say, oh, you do? Yeah, I do. It's my job. That's your preacher's job. And when they're praying for you, they're saying, hey, they're right here. They're, 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 they're in trouble. They're coming up to this, and they're trying to warn you. His job is to protect the people, preach the truth. He warned them. In chapter 7 and verse 1, uh, while the, the siege is going on, we see that Elisha says, Hear ye the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. He's saying, hey, you know what? The, the siege is going to be gone. He warns and he, and he can foretell the future. You know what? Preachers can tell you the future. They really can't. Now, we cannot necessarily, don't come to us and ask what's going to happen in the stock market or anything like that, <clears throat> but we can tell you where you're going. I remember one time, and I've, I've said this before to our young people, I remember one time, I didn't even know why I said it, I was talking with a young man, he was cheating in school. I said, are we going to have this conversation again someday, me sitting across from you in jail? 
And I don't know why I said that. He's, you know, he said, it was just cheating. Yeah, I know, but I was trying to bring home a serious point. Guess what? A year later, you know where I was sitting? I was sitting across from him in jail. I reminded him of what I said, and he remembered. I said, wasn't it a lot more comfortable in my office than it is here in this jail with you in this nice little cute orange jumpsuit? I was trying to get across the point. It's dangerous. And I told him where his future was headed. You see, a preacher can tell you where you're heading in the future because we have the principles of the Word of God that tell us. And after we've been, we don't have to have been in the ministry very long before we start to see these things come into play. He tries to warn you. He just brings the Word of God, he proclaims it, and he trusts God to be the truth. We see the king of, of Israel, he's kind of the susceptible prey. He might be you. It's kind of interesting when you study the story. You notice what we see about the king of Israel? We don't see him doing anything. Hey, king, don't go over near the enemy. Okay. Hey, go check and see if, he's, if that preacher's really telling the truth. Oh, he was? Uh, okay, I guess I won't go over there. And then we see this siege coming on Samaria. <coughs> and we see him going by and tells a story of some of the results of the famine. He's going, oh, this is horrible. But we don't see him ever engaging the enemy. We don't see him ever going on the attack. You know what he is doing? He's doing what a lot of you are doing. He's just getting by. He's just hoping that he's not going to get starved and that he's going to make it by. If that's where you're at right now, listen to the preacher, listen to the warnings. But you need to come to the point where you're like the preacher and you see what's coming. We need to be like Elisha prayed for the servant. Lord, open our eyes to see what's going on. We see another character in the story real quick in verse 2, and then i got to get to the main point of the message very shortly. Look at verse 2. All right, and, and in verse 1 we read, Elisha tells him, hey, you know what? Tomorrow, this siege is going to be done, and you guys are going to have more food than you know what to do with. Verse 2, then a Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make the windows in heaven, might this thing be? In other words, it's impossible. Not going to happen. King, you're an idiot if you're going to listen to the preacher again. And notice what Elisha says. And he said, Behold... Thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. We find that all of these men begin to turn on themselves, the Syrians, and there's a whole routing, and, and some lepers come out there and decide, you know, if we're going to die, let's go get killed rather than sit here and starve. And they run out there and they go, hey, there's all kinds of food. And after they're gathering it all up, they say, hey, you know what? Maybe we better go tell somebody else about all this. And so they run back and they let him know. And we come down to verse number 19. And the Lord, and that Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat, eat thereof. And so it fell upon him, for the people trod upon him in the gate. He died. There was the skeptic sitting around saying, hey, don't listen to the preacher. Hey, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And that guy was standing in the gate and goes, hey, what's everybody getting so excited about? Oh, my goodness, the blessings of God. But he never got any of them. Hey, there's always somebody around to be the skeptical pessimist trying to stop you from hearing the truth. Now, we see all of these things going on in this story and we have a decision to make. How are we going to look at it? There's two sets of eyes on this story. There's the servant who sees through earthly eyes and says, this enemy is mighty, he's great, and we can't handle it. We're going to be destroyed. There's the, the man who looks at everything through earthly eyes. It's the same thing of the pessimist. It's the same thing sometimes of the king of Israel. They're looking at things, and they only see things on a natural level. And they refuse to see things the way that God shows them and the way the preacher sees them. And then there's the Elisha, the king. Or, I'm sorry, Elisha, the preacher. 
And he says, I don't have to worry about it. I don't have time to preach it. There's three things. He says, I've got God's presence. I've got God's power. And I've got God's protection. He said, they that be, what are those next two words? With us. Some people don't like the beginning of 2 Corinthians 6 when it says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Once again, they get hung up on that verse, and they miss verse 18. And I will be a father unto you. Elisha didn't play ball. <laughs> Elisha didn't compromise. Elisha was a stick in the mud. Elisha was the guy that just kept sticking with God. And God said, I'm with you. He said, my friends, they don't like this. They don't want to surrender and do what God wants to do. Hey, so what? God says, I'm with you. And he said, they that be with us are what? More. Reminds me of 1 John 4. It says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yea, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And notice it says, and I already pointed this out, that the chariot, chariots were round about who? Elisha. God said, you're not getting my man. The enemy can come and attack all they want. The enemy can try to shut them down. But listen, when you are with God, it doesn't matter if it's just you. You're in the majority. You will win. There will always be a battle. Welcome to the Christian life. It's war. But it's supernatural war, and God is with you. The Word of God is always there to warn us and show us the future. All we have to do is listen to it. And then we must keep our focus on the eternal so that we're not dominated by or distracted by the earthly. I didn't have time to apply this a whole lot this morning. But the message really is simple. You have an enemy. He's out to destroy you. He wants to be the only one that you will listen to. And he seems big, he seems mighty, he seems irresistible, and it seems like you can't win. But if you'll say, Lord, open my eyes. And help me see this temptation. Help me see this enemy the way you see them. Help me spot this for what it really is and that, God, you're in control. If we will learn to do that, honestly, we can be at peace no matter what is going on because we know God's in control and God will win the battle. He's there. He's with us. He's surrounding us. And he that is with us is more than those that be against us. Our heads. Teen, and the Lord, and that Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat, eat thereof. And so it fell upon him, for the people trod upon him in the gate. He died. There was the skeptic sitting around saying, hey, don't listen to the preacher. Hey, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And that guy was standing in the gate and goes, hey, what's everybody getting so excited about? Oh, my goodness, the blessings of God. But he never got any of them. Hey, there's always somebody around to be the skeptical pessimist trying to stop you from hearing the truth. Now, we see all of these things going on in this story and we have a decision to make. How are we going to look at it? There's two sets of eyes on this story. There's the servant who sees through earthly eyes and says, this enemy is mighty, he's great, and we can't handle it. We're going to be destroyed. 
There's the, the man who looks at everything through earthly eyes. It's the same thing of the pessimist. It's the same thing sometimes of the king of Israel. They're looking at things, and they only see things on a natural level, and they refuse to see things the way that God shows them and the way the preacher sees them. And then there's the Elisha, the king. Or, I'm sorry, Elisha, the preacher. And he says, I don't have to worry about it. I don't have time to preach it. There's three things. He says, I've got God's presence. I've got God's power, and I've got God's protection. He said, they that be, what are those next two words? With us. Some people don't like the beginning of 2 Corinthians 6 when it says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Once again, they get hung up on that verse, and they miss verse 18. And I will be a father unto you. Elisha didn't play ball. <laughs> Elisha didn't compromise. Elisha was a stick in the mud. Elisha was the guy that just kept sticking with God. And God said, I'm with you. He said, my friends, they don't like this. They don't want to surrender and do what God wants to do. Hey, so what? God says, I'm with you. And he said, they that be with us are what? More. Reminds me of 1 John 4, it says, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yea, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And notice it says, and I already pointed this out, that the chariot, chariots were round about who? Elisha. God said, you're not getting my man. The enemy can come and attack all they want. The enemy can try to shut them down. But listen, when you are with God, it doesn't matter if it's just you. You're in the majority. You will win. There will always be a battle. Welcome to the Christian life. It's war. But it's supernatural war, and God is with you. The Word of God is always there to warn us and show us the future. All we have to do is listen to it. And then we must keep our focus on the eternal so that we're not dominated by or distracted by the earthly. I didn't have time to apply this a whole lot this morning, but the message really is simple. You have an enemy. He's out to destroy you. He wants to be the only one that you will listen to. And he seems big, he seems mighty, he seems irresistible, and it seems like you can't win. But if you'll say, Lord, open my eyes and help me see this temptation, help me see this enemy the way you see them. Help me spot this for what it really is and that, God, you're in control. If we will learn to do that, honestly, we can be at peace no matter what is going on because we know God's in control and God will win the battle. He's there. He's with us. He's surrounding us. And he that is with us is more than those that be against us.